now oh. yes yes um good evening everybody sorry for the delay I had some uh, technical issues with my laptop uh, <clears throat> so um i thought we will uh, discuss distributed databases today uh, i hope you all watch the other two lectures on um, hdfs the first lecture was on hdfs the hadoop distributed file system and the second lecture was on uh, yarn and mapreduce and now hbase is actually a, a real world use case developed to run on hadoop on the hdfs system using uh, yarn and mapreduce okay so we're going to we're going to look at a, a real uh, use case for big data system okay um so here is a little bit of history uh, in uh, on relational and distributed databases uh as some of you know uh, relational databases uh, predate uh, distributed databases uh from the 90s we had uh, you know rdbms in uh, different varieties and around 2000 a clear distinction was made between operational databases that are essentially transactional and uh, olap which is for data warehousing and for analytics because people figured out that the uh, the the constraints of a transactional system uh, were not conducive for uh, doing large volume analytics okay and from that uh, our that distinction has been followed through uh, to distributed database systems so now um, you know in 2015 you had of course the original rdb rdbms systems and you also had no sql systems which are essentially key value column or stores that were distributed that were developed to run on uh, hadoop okay and uh, you can see a little bit of um, the history of hbase itself um uh, you know just like mapreduce and uh, other uh, technologies uh, google pioneered uh, uh, you know column or stores uh, the distributed data system uh, database that google used was called big table and um they also uh um you know they, they published uh, the their first paper on big table in around 2006 and you can see that the uh, first mature version of hbase was released in around 2008 now uh, there was a, hbase was initially a sub project of uh, hadoop and then uh, eventually it became an apache top level project and um, you know you can run hbase in standalone mode like for example on your laptop or desktop but that's you know essentially a, a useless situation it's not going to handle big data okay the uh, uh, hbase uh, for real use and real consumption has to be run on hd and hdfs or some kind of distributed file system okay so here is a overview of the hadoop ecosystem to show you where uh, hbase itself stands okay so you got um, the hadoop ecosystem has administration tools like zookeeper and of course file systems like hdfs and mapreduce is a computational tool or technique actually and then you have a whole bunch of uh, no sql databases that are that can be uh, run on hadoop okay and um, i have listed four different types of no sql databases uh, the first one is key value stores um, the second are document stores like mongo db and couch db and then you have multi column stores and that is where uh, hbase fits in 
okay, big data or big table, uh, I, sorry, that should be big table, big table, which was the original uh, version of column or distributed column or store developed by Google and um, many of its variants like Hypertable, Cassandra and HBase all fit in that category, okay? And then there are also some graph DBs uh, that fall in the same category. Now, when you are studying HBase, um, you know, you will also encounter uh, the name Hive and Hive is more SQL-like, but it's actually a workflow tool that's implemented on Hadoop. And we won't be looking into details uh, of Hive, but uh, let me just briefly say that it is just a SQL-like interface to the data that is stored on HDFS, okay? It is not, it does not have a relational schema. It does not have a, a normalized uh, tabular module. It just has, it is just a SQL-like interface to uh, the data stored on HDFS, okay? So that gives you an overall picture of where HBase lies inside the uh, Hadoop ecosystem. Okay, so here are four different examples just to show you the, um, you know, diversity. Um, for example, Cloudera uh, has a Hadoop and HDFS. It uses Scoop or Flume for ingesting data into HDFS, and it uses HBase as its uh, distributed uh, database, okay? Uh, by comparison, you look at Google, it has MySQL essentially as the um, uh, tool for ingesting data into GFS, and it uses a big table. Uh, the, uh, you know, Facebook and Yahoo both use HBase. Uh, we will look, at, look into the uses of Zookeeper. It's also a major part of HBase, or in other words, uh, HBase, uh, uses some properties of Zookeeper for its own function, okay? So this uh, gives you a good idea of how different, um, you know, how, how diverse uh, the Hadoop ecosystem is, um, even among different uh, enterprises. Okay, uh, let me just make sure that, uh, and now, if you have any questions, you can stop me. Uh, that's not a problem. Um, but otherwise, I will continue. Okay. Uh, okay. So before we go into uh, the details of distributed databases and HPS itself, um, let's have a quick refresher on relational databases, okay, so that we understand why relational databases do not work for big data, okay? So the main feature of relational databases uh, is that they support ACID transactions. And uh, you may know, some of you may know what that means. ACID is an acronym for atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable, okay? Now, this is, a, this is a major requirement. It is enforced. Any relational database should and only support ACID transactions, okay? And then when we move on to distributed databases, we will see this is what holds up uh, relational databases from being used for big data to work with large volumes of data, okay? So in the um, ACID is an acronym. The A stands for atomic. So what we mean by atomic is that each part of a transaction, okay? We are taking a, let's say we are doing a large uh, join and then an insert or update, okay? So every single part of the transaction is treated as a single action, okay? All the different parts of a transactions, transaction are treated as a single action. So the transaction will be executed as a whole, 
or it will fail as a whole. Okay, there, there, there is no intermediate state. There is really no way to have one or two classes or one or two parts of the uh, um, transaction to be implemented while the others fail. Okay, so atomic means singular and whole. Okay, the, every transaction has to be treated as singular and whole, and it has to be executed as a whole. Okay, you cannot have partial implementation or partial execution of a transaction. So I have shown you a simple um, uh, model on the right hand side. You got customers table, employees table. You got primary keys, customer ID, and employee ID. And then you have an orders table, uh, which has the customer ID and employee ID as the uh, foreign keys. And there is a new primary key there, which is the order ID. And the orders table is tied to an order details table, where you have things like unit price, quantity, and discount. Okay, so it's a very very simple uh, model that kind of exemplifies all the uh, important features of a uh, relational schema. Okay, so now let's assume that you are trying to create a new order and uh, you are uh, creating an, uh, a new order, pulling in a customer ID, an employer ID, and then you are entering an order date, okay, with a shipping date and a ship address, and then you are also um, you know, creating a number of rows in the order details table. Okay. Now, suppose in the transaction, your order date does not follow the date format. Okay. Let's say for some reason it comes in as a string that does not make sense. It does not. Uh, it is not in the date format. It will never be the case that in an RDBMS you will create an order that has all the other fields entered except the order date because it is not consistent. And, okay, so the, the transaction as a whole will fail. That's what atomic means. And the order details will not be created unless the order itself is created, the order record is created, okay? So now consistent means that you check for all the constraints, okay, all the rules and restrictions of the database, such as constraints and the cascades and triggers, okay. So um, again, that that in the same example, okay, you try to enter a date field which was not actually in the date format, okay. Uh, the database will automatically check to see that uh, you know whether those uh, entries are consistent, okay? they, whether the formats are consistent, whether the records, uh, um, you know, satisfy other constraints like unique keys and things like that. Every single rule and restriction will be checked for every transaction, okay? If any part of the transaction violates the constraints, then the transaction as a whole fails, okay? Now, the RD, RDBMS does all this for one purpose, okay, and that is data integrity, okay. So the main concern of a relational database is to have uncorrupted data, okay. You don't have loose hanging records, you don't have corrupt fields and things like that. The data should always be usable, okay. That is the main design uh, constraint of any relational database. Um, so, uh, moving on, the third constraint is uh, isolation, okay? So, what it simply means is that you have very good concurrency control. If you have two different transactions that are trying to manipulate the same piece of data, okay, let's say the same row or the same record in a table, of the same field in a uh, record, then it will never happen that one of them does a partial read of the record with an old value while the other one is simultaneously updating that value for that uh, column. 
today. So, for example, give you an example. Um, again, if uh, you know you are trying to change the order date by one day on a whole bunch of records, and somebody else is trying at the same time to ch change the ship dates, uh, shipping dates back by a day, you will, ne you know, it, it, both of them should happen uh, sequentially. Okay, even though the two uh, records are happening almost at the same time. Okay, so concurrency control simply means that uh, every um, transaction is very well isolated and as and concurrent executions are actually uh, pipelined almost sequentially. Okay, so that the, again the goal here is data integrity. Okay, so and then the last thing is of course uh, durable, and that simply means that once a transaction is completely executed, then the results are persisted on the disk. Okay, so um, you know it's it cannot just uh, after a transaction is executed, uh, you cannot go back to an older state. Okay, if it, if a transaction is successfully executed, you cannot go back to an older state because of some issue in the system, you need uh, you need to actually update or alter or update or uh, insert or delete that record to make a change. Okay, there must be purposeful alteration of the data. Otherwise, that that result is persistent. Okay, so you can you can already see that uh, acid constraints uh, have been. Um, you know, are, are essentially the, the goal of acid constraints is to maintain very high level of data integrity. Okay, and you can also kind of intuitively see that all of these checks and balances are going to take a lot of time. Okay, and that's exactly why you cannot have large volumes of data stored in data, uh, relation databases. Um, you know, for example, if you're trying to do like five different joins of uh, several tables just to get like, you know, a million records, that's going to take a very long time um, because the tables are normalized. And secondly, if you're trying to insert or update any data, then, uh, you know, each transaction is going to take a long time because all the constraints have to be checked. And then if you're trying to update 1 million records, that's going to take even longer, okay? So um, here is uh, what, uh, here is how distributed database systems are envisioned, okay? And this is going to be very different from uh, uh, the constraints used for relational databases. So the, uh, the main design principle here is called the CAP theorem. CAP, again, is an acronym for uh, Consistent, Available, and Partition Tolerant. And I have to say right away that consistent here is different from the consistent in ACID, okay? In, uh, in ACID, consistent stands for uh, checking data types and uniqueness of keys and things like that. Here, consistent, consistency means that all replicas of the same data should have the same value across the distributed system. Okay, now, um, you know, here is where it will really help if you have watched the lectures on um, HDFS and MapReduce. So you know that uh, in HDFS, a large amount of data or a large file is chunked up into, into blocks of size 256 MB, and each block is, block is replicated across the entire uh, cluster, okay? And if you think back about how we read data from HDFS, you will know that the client sends out a request to the uh, master node, which contains the metadata on what and which block of which file is stored on uh, which data node. So the uh, master node is simply going to tell the client, is, is simply going to give back to the client three uh, values, 
okay, for three for the for where the three data nodes are that contain uh, the three replicas of a block. Now, which data node a client goes to to read the data is it depends on a variety of factors. So, if two clients want to read the same file at the same time, they could be accessing the same block from two different data nodes, okay? So that is why consistency is required. So if you have two users uh, querying the system to look at the data, you don't want them getting back different results, which will happen if the two replicas of a block are not consistent, okay? So consistent here means that every replica of every block across the whole distributed system uh, should be the same, okay? Now, it's a different matter whether we can practically enforce this or not, okay? But this is a design principle. Okay? We demand that a distributed database should, ha should be consistent. So the second um, constraint is availability, okay? We also uh, demand that almost all the nodes in a distributed data system uh, that are live at a given point in time should be available for read or write operation. Okay, now you can see right away that this is the, the consistent and available conditions are going to cause a lot of problems. They don't go together very well. Okay, so this is illustrated on the uh, in the figure on the right hand side. Okay, so uh, let's take a very simple example of um, you know, some uh, some user trying to insert the final scores of uh, two different players from two different countries, okay? So the client uh, sends out the insert request to a master node or a leader who then sends out um, or executes the insert operations individually to all the follower nodes, okay? Now, um, you know, because of, uh, you know, uh, transmission delays and network delays, uh, one of the nodes, whichever is farther away from the uh, leader on the rack, is going to receive the insert operation later, okay? So you can, I mean, it's very easy to see that uh, two things can happen here. One is, the insert operation is immediately executed in follower one, and at that time, two users are accessing the same piece of data. They're gonna be getting back different results, okay? So one person thinks Germany won, the other person, you know, does not know that yet. So, uh, and this is simply because of the delay, okay? So this violates the consistency uh, con condition because, uh, you know there is a uh, there is a time delay you can see between the um, between the two insert operations and during the time delay the two follower nodes are going to have different data so it's not consistent across the distributed distributed uh, system now that is that's happening because we are letting both the nodes be available to the users at the same time now, instead, if we lock down follower two till its data gets updated, then everything will be consistent across, across the distributed system, okay? So, um, consistency and availability are kind of mutually exclusive, okay? And what caps, so let me quickly explain also partition tolerance. It simply means that, you know, no matter how many data nodes or racks or the switches are out, the system must continue to operate, okay? So the CAP theorem says that given partition tolerance, okay, if you assume your system has to be partition tolerant, then you can either have consistency or availability, but not both, okay? Uh, that was a conjecture made in 2012 and it has later been mathematically proven. So we know uh, that this is something that we need to consider in designing distributed data, database systems. 
So if you want a partition tolerant distributed data database, then you can either design it to be consistent or available but not work. Okay. So that is the main difference between an RDBMS system and distributed databases. Okay, so here's a summary. Uh, asset consistency, as I said, is all about database rules, enforcing consistency uh, of data, um, making sure that the transactions are atomic, in other words, uh, they don't get executed partially, and so on. And all of that is going to take time, so it is not, uh, you know, it is not conducive for uh, big uh, data, large volumes of data. Now, cap consistency assures that every replica of the value spread across the nodes has the same exact value at the same time if you compromise availability. Okay, so you have to design, uh, you have to decide, let's say you're designing a new distributed database system, do you want it to be available? Do you want every piece of, uh, every, uh, you know, node to be available to the users for queries, then it will happen that different users will end up with different uh, results for the same query. Okay. All right. So, HBase um, is, of course, a distributed database system and it is built on uh, the Hadoop distributed file system. And uh, you know, clearly it does not have asset transactions. And it is a columnar store, so it basically has key values, and it is a wide table implementation. In other words, uh, you know, you, you have done a lot of, uh, if you, you know, if you work with RDBMS, you often have to do lots of joins to get um, your results back, and then, you know, the results are, wide, okay, you have multiple columns from uh, data. Uh, the, the columns are made up from data that were in different tables, okay? So it is in an unnormalized form. So the question is, um, if you want to reduce the time and the effort and computation, uh, then you can compromise normality for uh, breadth of data. So that's exactly uh, the idea behind HBase is that it's a columnar store. In other words, you can keep on adding columns, okay, um, without limit, almost without limit. You can keep on adding adding columns. So there is no, you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, certain column values being null uh, uh, in others, you know, or, or you don't have to worry about uh, the results being very sparse. You know, you could have a row that has just one value in a column and then nothing for the rest of the columns, okay? Um, because that's, that is by choice. We choose uh, HBase to be an unnormalized or denormalized implementation, okay? So that you don't have to spend all the time and computation and other resources on joining normalized tables, okay? And, um, and it, it, this, design gives you faster random access of data, okay? So those are the main uh, features that um, were originally uh, built into um, big table and they were inherited uh, by HBase, okay? So briefly describe the internal architecture of HBase. Again, if you had, um, watch the lectures on HDFS and MapReduce, a lot of this will be very familiar to you, okay? Um, <clears throat> the design principles are very similar, and you will see that many of the features are directly inherited from the HDFS architecture. Okay? The features of HBS architecture are directly inherited from HBS architecture, okay? So, um, the most important part of uh, HBase architecture are what are called region, okay? Now, a region is simply a chunk of um, a columnar table or a columnar store, okay? So, you can see here um, there is one column called key, 
and then you got a bunch of uh, column families labeled column B, column C, and so on. Okay. Now you can imagine this table having uh, maybe 100 million rows. Okay. So that uh, those data are chunked horizontally, and you have a start key and an end key. Okay. And these are row keys. And that part is called a region. Okay, that horizontal slice uh, through the entire columnar uh, data is called a region. Okay, and a region server can contain multiple regions. Okay, you can begin to see the parallel between a region server and a data node. Okay, uh, in data node, you have blocks of data stored, and uh, here you have regions. Okay, and regions are just uh, parts of uh, the entire, uh, the, the, the whole file, okay. The second important part is uh, the H master, or the H base master, and we'll look into the details of H master uh, soon, but um, the other thing that you see here is the zookeeper, now, very briefly, Zookeeper is also, I think I already showed you uh, the Hadoop ecosystem and, the, and Zookeeper was on it. Uh, it is essentially an administrative tool. Uh, if you want to remember only two things about the Zookeeper, um, that should be configuration management and synchronization, okay? Uh, the Zookeeper, Zookeeper is also a distributed system. Um, you know, it runs on HDFS, and it accomplishes two things, essentially. One is configuration management, and the other is synchronization. And the reason we have Zookeeper is because, you know, many, any application that runs on HDFS needs these two features, okay? You need some kind of a configuration management with, with a bunch of configuration files, and you need um, it's a synchronization, okay? And um, initially, almost uh, every application was building these features, um, you know, into it. Uh, in other words, people were actually trying to write all this into each application. Uh, later on, these two features were extracted out, and you had Zookeeper, um, you know, dedicated to managing uh, just those two uh, operations. And um, so we will see how Zookeeper is leveraged by HBase for uh, synchronization operations. Okay, so this is the HMaster, and you can begin to see that, you know, it's kind of like the name node um, with a few differences, okay? Uh, the, the, the first main function of HMaster is to assign regions to re region servers and keep a record of it, okay? So when you're trying, let's say you have a huge HBase table and you are trying to append um, a million new rows, the HMaster knows which region servers are most active and which are not, okay? And then it picks the ones that are not most active and uh, sends out the new uh, data to that region server to be split up into regions and stored locally. Okay, that's one of the main things that the uh, that HMaster does. Okay, um, and the second thing it does is when you when it gets the queries from clients, it is responsible for again translating those queries into whatever operations are required to. Uh, run on the region servers, and it sends out those operations to the region servers. So the Zookeeper uh, uh, is used for uh, tracking which region servers are alive and which are not, okay? Again, um, there are a lot of parallels between this and how HDFS itself operates. Uh, you know that in um, HDFS, the data nodes send uh, periodic heartbeats uh, to the master node, and uh, every often they send a report on all the stored blocks. Okay, 
the same kind of thing happens here, but the region servers don't do that, um, you know, the heartbeat and the report. Instead, HMaster leverages Zookeeper to know which uh, region servers are active and which ones are not. Okay. So that is the function of Zookeeper in HBA. And again, there is a meta table. Uh, you probably guessed this already. Uh, the meta table stores are a map between the table name, the key range, start and end key range, the region, and maps all that, uh, all those key values, keys, to uh, one value, which is the region server. So if you want to query a certain file uh, or a certain table from uh, row 100 to row 200, region server, the uh, meta table tells you, you know, like rows 50 to 150 are in this region server and rows 150 to 250 are in the other region server and you have to put together the uh, data. Okay, so that's essentially the architecture of the um, of HBase. Okay, now uh, let me go over write and read operations very briefly. So you have a read cache. Okay, every region server has two types of caches. One is the block cache, which is a read cache, and, they, and the other is a write-ahead log, okay? The write-ahead log is used for write operations, as you probably guessed, and the block cache is used for read, uh, read operations, okay? Uh, and the min store is part of the write operation, okay? So let's look at, um, Okay, let's look at read, uh, read operations first, very quickly. So when you uh, read, when you send something uh, to the region server and you try to read the data, it reads it, stores it in the block cache and sends out the result, okay? Uh, because, you know, statistically, the same data will be queried again, will be used again. And the next time, it doesn't have to go to the region to extract the data. You can just send it out from the block cache. And the block cache keeps on growing. And eventually, when it is full, you look at the, um, the region server, figures out the least used part of the block cache, least frequently used part of the block cache, and just delete it, okay, so to make more space. Okay, so block cache kind of uh, speeds up read operations um, in the region servers. Okay, now um, write operations. So let's say you are executing a put command. The first thing that happens is the put command is stored in the read ahead, write ahead log. Okay, because write is a time consuming operation. One thing that can happen frequently is before the entire write operation is executed, uh, something can fail, okay? And maybe the entire region server some, uh, goes down or some of the regions are lost, okay? So then you should be able to recreate uh, the write operation from the write-ahead log, okay? That's essentially the purpose of the write-ahead log. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what the write-ahead log does is it, uh, it writes into memstore, okay, which is not uh, in HDF is not the permanent uh, uh, store in the file system, but as the name says, it is in memory. And when that is full, it leaks into uh, the HDFS uh, data node as H files. Okay, so H files are simply uh, the blocks and replicas of blocks in HDFS. Okay, so it's um, that's a very simple overview of write operations in uh, HP. So here is a summary. Um, the benefits of uh, HBase architecture is that it has a strong consistency model. So when a write returns, all readers will see the same value. So you know that uh, uh, availability is restricted. And there is a lot of built-in recovery, and it is integrated with the uh, with HDFS. Okay. Now the uh, issues with HDFS that are 
slowly being um, uh, worked on or that the write ahead log replay is slow. So if something fails and you have to replay the entire write ahead log, that's kind of um, slow and uh, crash recovery is also slow. Um, and, um, you know, but, uh, with every new version, there is always an improvement in speed. Okay, so that's uh, a very quick and brief overview of HBase and distributed systems. Um, you know, I can take questions on uh, all the three topics because um, we didn't have uh, lectures on the previous two. I mean, we posted videos. So if you have any questions on HDFS, MapReduce, Yarn, HBase, uh, you know, now is the time. And uh, Elena is going to uh, walk us through, um, you know, how to get access to HBase and how to uh, start working on your assignment. Are there any questions? Oh, please uh, unmute yourself. I think almost everybody is on mute. If you are talking or you can send via chat. Do you have any questions on uh, HDFS? or MapReduce. Okay, maybe we can uh, move on to the next part and uh, Elena can... Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Uh, I'll stop sorry. sharing. Yes, I no need to uh, share the screen. Okay. Oh, how do I write to share? Yeah. I think I gave you. All right. So now I can share my screen. So I guess, um, first of all, as you can see, guys, you need to create an account on the demo cloud. So I guess for the purpose of this presentation, should I assume that everybody sign up on the demo cloud without any issues, right? Okay. If there are no questions about that, then I'm going to proceed. Uh, if you are, if you are using the Mac, I believe there is a command terminal that you can use and you just SSH. If not, if you're a Windows user like me, you have to install a program called Party. And you want to make sure that you install in the latest version, okay? And I'm going to show you some, something else that it's not in 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 a, in a work through, right? That it's not in this work document. I'll show you something else, and that is going to make your screenshots look much nicer. I'll show you what I'm talking about. But when you log in here, the scissors, you want to make sure that you select an SSH. It's not tell not nothing else. You want to select SSH. And what you might find helpful is that you want to save the session. If you save it, next time you just select your saved session and you click on load and just log in. You don't need to go back to the demo cloud and pick up this URL or go back to the, the Word handout and to pick up this URL, right? Okay. So here, basically, that's what I'm showing you how to save it, but very important. Very first time, this is going to happen only, only on the first login. You're going to get this party security alert. Make sure that you click yes, okay? But uh, if you use later, if you use a different machine to do your assignment, you're going to get this alert again. You have to click yes, right? So here, I'm just showing you that I'm logged in at HBase. Right, and I have to type this command to start. The, I have to type my login and my password, right? And it's the same login and password that you set up for the demo cloud. And then you're just going to run the command to start the uh, HBase, right? Uh, so here you are at the prompt, 
and you just go in well which edge base you're just gonna check if edge base is installed let's assume it is so you just run edge base shell and now from there I'm gonna show you something else here is your party right let me show you what I did to change colors so that could make your screenshots much nicer if you can see better when it's a dark font on a white background right well it's a personal preference but this is what you can do you click on this corner here and then you can do this change settings do you see that change settings and then here I can change my colors so I can do the see this foreground right and I can do the background see this so basically what I did was to change the background, I just selected this and I clicked on modify, right? So I can basically change my background and I can change my foreground. That's what I did here, okay? So it's, it's gonna, well, sometimes it can just improve the uh, readability and then you can save it, of course, right? You can, you can go in to the session here and, and you can save it, right? You just select this session and click save. Okay. Okay. Let me close this out. Let me cancel it. Uh, for the purpose of today's demo, I'm going to use a different application. Here it is. So we're going to work on uh, uh, hotels, right? And uh, this is a logical view of the hotel tables that I'm going to build. I want to have something like a column family with a general information such as brand, size, rating, and and it could be something else. It could be location. We don't know. Uh, people can enter as many uh, general information uh, criteria or there was this characteristics as they want to, right? Then there could be something on accommodation and something on amenity, right? Uh, but again, see here, I can say, for instance, if the hotel has a gym, hotel has a spa, hotel has a pool, maybe you want to do something like a massage room. Well, massage room is part of the spa, but you could make something else, right? You could say garage. It, it could be anything, right? And uh, also, there is no way to force the values yes or no. I can enter anything I want. I don't have to even provide the hotel name. I can just put in a uh, amenity value, right? So basically, and here I'm gonna do something on purpose right now. I'm going to try to create a table. So to create table, it's a create command, right? But what I did here, uh, well, it's my personal preference. I like to type all of the commands in the editor before and and then I copy paste, right? So uh, here it is. This is a create command, and create command is going to create a table called hotel. And here, these three are basically are the family names, right? So what I'm gonna do, gonna do right now is I'm going to try to run this command, right? So it's a family, right? These three families. Let me try running this command, and I'm going to get an error, right? Okay, now, look, I want to copy and paste. To copy and paste, it's just basically to paste, it's a right click, okay? Nothing by the right click. See this? I got an error message, and the reason is I already have the table name called hotel, right? If I do this, list, and then I have to put the, the in the double quotes, I have to I have to put that uh, the um, hotel. Oops. See, so this is called the uh, the regular expression, right? So I'm supposed to get all tables that start with the word hot, right? See, it it tells me that I already uh, have uh, that I already have this uh, table, right? So what I have to do is I need to drop my table, but in order to drop the table, I first have to disable it, right? So I wrote my command somewhere in, in here, so let me do this, F5, disable, 
Oops, okay, here it is. So, oh no, that one is checks if this if disable, right? So what I need to do is I have to disable my table before I can actually drop it, right? Okay, so I'll have to type it. I'll type it, not a problem. All right, but let's see what happens if I just try to drop, right? What's going to happen if I just do this? Let's see. If I want to just do this one, drop, and I'm going to put the, the, the hotel, right? Oh, actually, it's angle close. Let's see what it's going to do. Is it going to give me an error message? I think it does, right? Because you cannot just drop. The table is enabled. See this? I cannot do this, right? So what I have to do is I have to do this for disable hotel, right? But if you're lazy typing, you know, you can hit the up and down error, and it's going to let you navigate the, the commands history. So this is disable hotel, and now Jesus, it's going to take a little time to run, and if I'm not sure if my hotel is disabled, I can do this. See, this is disabled hotel, and this is going to return true if the table is disabled, right? It is. So now I can do this. I can drop, right? But always it's a good practice to check if your table exists before you start creating it, right? Oops, what's going on? See, when you do this, you just type something, right? And it will exit the, the prompt, right? It will exit. Okay, look. Um, now I'm using the, the command history, right? I just use the up error. There we go. Now I dropped my table. Now I should be able to create it, right? So this is what I'm doing. I can use the up errors to go back to the command that I already ran. And now I'm going to create this. So now I have my table again, right? But if I do this, count command returns the number of rows that I have, right? What is it going to return? It should return zero. Why do you think it's that? It's because I did not return any data, right? So now let's decide what I need to do. Uh, in a regular database, you would write an insert statement, right? I would say something like insert into hotel, and then I would say, uh, I would list my column names, right? And then I would put values, yada, yada, and put all these values. I cannot do it here, can I? Nope, I cannot do it here. So what do I need to do is I have to insert one value at a time, right? And uh, to do this, you'd run the put command, you have to specify the table name, you have to specify the row key, right? And you have to specify the family name and the column name. So it's going to be column within the family. But before we do that, let's check what the table looks like, right? So I'm going to type, uh, it'll look at the describe command. The describe command is going to give you the table structure. Now, take a look at this. Aha, uh -huh. I just have column families, but I really have nothing in the families, right? Uh, so, what I'm going to do right now is uh, I'm going to add my first row. So, here is the code, and after this a class, I can give you a copy of the code. But take a look at it. This is what it's going to do is I have a family called general information, and I want to add the first row, row 1, and I want to add the hotel brand called Double Tree, right? So what is it going to do here is that here. This is the first row. And it's going to just add the value of a brand. And it's going to be Double Tree. So let's go ahead and copy this line right here. Control C. And I'm going to do, again, to paste it, you just do the right click. There we go. So now let's see what happens. Describe hotel. So basically, I think somewhere here you should see that I edited it, right? Okay, but basically what I just did was I just added one field. Uh, or what you could do, actually, let's do this. Let's do, we can run the get command, right? And uh, the way you do it is basically, see this, it's in here. I'll show you. The get command, now something to keep in mind is that get command is going only
return one row. Okay, scan command will turn, return the rows range, but the get command is a get hotel, and I can type uh, that I want. Well, I want the first row, right? I cannot get the second row. It's because I already have. I I, I only have one row, right? So here it is. Look at the syntax. Get table name and a row number, right? There we go. So here it just tells me that I have general information print and a timestamp. Oh, looks like oh no, I didn't misspell print. I did not. What it does is it's wrapping. So here I can make my window a little bit bigger and rerun. It was wrapping this the the, the field name, right? And here notice that. It showed me it showed me the timestamp and the value. Timestamp could be very important because sometimes you have more than one version of the data, and I'll get to it, right? Each each value can have multiple versions. And in your homework assignment, you're asked to you ask a question about the versions, right? So you want to think about it. What happens if you have to if I make a change and I want to roll back, right? Just just and when you answer that question, think about it. What happens if you have to roll back? Or on the other hand, what happens if you store thousands of versions? Well, so it's something for you to think about it. Okay? So now, see that? So I, I have, what do I have right now? One row, and I have only brand populated, right? Or what else I could do is, how else I can check my work? I can do the count. Count command tells me that I only have one row now. So let's continue. I'm going back to this block of code, and what I'm doing here, I'm just uh, I'm I'm just populating the brand, and I can go ahead and do this. Think here, I'm gonna copy the whole block, Control C, and then to paste, I'm just gonna do this here. There we go. Okay. Now, what happened now? is I just populated this field here, the brand. And now let's think about it. What, am I, what do I expect to see? When I run my count command, I expect to see what? 10 rows, right? Let's see if this is the case. Now I have to go, I have to go a lot because see, this, see how many commands I ran? I ran like nine commands, right? So my history is getting bigger. Count hotel, that's right, it returns 10. Now, what's going to happen is I'm unable to use the get command to see all 10 rows. The reason is the get only returns one row. So, as there is an option, I can use my scan command, right? Scan. So, let's do that. And let's do scan, right? Now, take a look at it. What do I expect to be returned? I expect to be returned 10 rows, right? Well, well, the reason it returned 10 rows because I did not specify the specific range. Uh, take a look here. It, it filtered, how it will sort it rather, 1 and 10. It's not looking at it as a number, okay? It's not looking at it in numerical order. So if I was, if I had row 11, it, it would have been uh, 1, 10, 11, 2, 3, right? Okay, now let's look at it next, what I'm going to do. I'm going to populate now size. Uh, currently, I don't have a size. Uh, the, the general information family does not have a size. Uh, for the size, I can add it to one row. I can add it to two row. Or Well, I don't have to add size to, uh, to all rows, right? And there's no such a thing as null. There's no such a thing as null, unlike in a relational database. Uh, here, I also have to be careful with values because I want uh, the size of the hotel to be mega, medium, large, small, right? This is what I want. But it does not prevent me from entering what I don't want, right? So here, you really have to watch out what you enter in. Okay, so let's go ahead and... This is the this is the size block of code. Well, I just go ahead, copy and paste, Control C. But again, it's a matter of preference, okay? But I have to tell you that, and I always tell that, and somebody always does not follow the instruction. Avoid typing that in Word. And the reason is Word puts 
uh, quotes that don't get recognized. It put curly quotes. And this program does not like curly quotes. So don't do this. Save yourself time on the night when the assignment is due, okay? No, this is, this is sad. This is a serious, sad story. Okay, now, let's take a look at this. What do I expect to get when I run count? Uh, okay, how many rows did I just insert? I inserted... Well, this is a very tricky question. It's a good multiple choice question, right? Uh, how many rows do you think I'm going to get? Well, let's think about it. Uh, some of you might think uh, 20. No, I did not insert 20. I did not run the 20 put statements. Uh, some of you may say, okay, maybe 17, right? Because Yelena ran 10 put statements before, and now, she's run, she, and now she ran seven more. I don't think so. Why? It's because... See this? This is a row key, right? I'm not changing the key, right? I'm adding what I did here. I added the new uh, attribute, right? Because I have I have a general information family, and I added size to the added size to the general information, right? So my count is supposed to return ten, right? Exactly. So now, on the other hand, if I do the if I if I do the scan, I'm still supposed to get ten rows, but I'm supposed to get the values for the size. See this? So now this is getting bigger, right? And look at the sorting. It goes the row one, row ten, row two, right? The output is gonna get even bigger. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to do the rating here. And this is the same family rating, and then I'm gonna go ahead and copy this here accommodation. Oops, yes. So accommodation is just gonna be like a room type. And let me go ahead, copy all of this stuff, and run all of this. And I'll show you what's happening. Oops. Okay. So now it looks like did it run it? <laughs> yes, it did. It's because, see, the, the reason I got this here is because I had a space. I had a blank line in the code. See this? So now, when I run count, what am I supposed to get? Well, did I insert new rows? No, I did not, because I used the same key, right? So it's supposed to get still get 10. Uh, here, notice that I can start entering amenities, and I can enter, I can come up with new amenity, right and i can do something like yes or no or i can just not enter anything this is just uh, totally optional it's not no it's not no and there is no check constraint the way it is in a relational database there is no default constraint right i cannot say hey if they if they don't specify anything it's going to be no nope there is no such a thing right okay so that, just just keep it in mind right so, now what we're going to do is take a look at big mess. What's going to happen if I run, if I, if I run the scan command now? See this? It's going to be a mess because, take a look, it's going to return everything, right? But in my case, I only have 10 rows. Well, good news, I only have 10 rows, right? Okay, so now let's go back to our editor. Uh, get command is going to return just one row. See that this is example here. Uh, this is going to print the whole second row. But, well, in our case, I have, look here. In the second row, this is what I have populated. I have general information, brand, rating, size, and I have uh, the breakfast. The breakfast is going to be if it's included or not. So let's see this. This is what I expect to get, right? This is row number two. And that's exactly what I expect to get. I expect only four values, and that's what it got printed. The values that what I did not populate, they're not here. Because they're not, we cannot say that they're null, they're just not, it don't exist, right? It's, it's not the same as null in the database. So just keep that in mind, right? 
Okay, now, suppose that I have multiple families with multiple fields, and I want to see just one, right? And uh, suppose that I'm lazy to scroll, I don't have time to scroll. So, uh, the good news are that I can specify the families that I want to see. Like, for instance, here, if I want to see only the second row and I want to see the accommodations family, just an example. Let's see what's going to happen. I got my accommodation and I only have this uh, here, breakfast, and it's going to give me breakfast included. How do I check my work? I can look here, see this? So this is a logical view, right? And I want to check to make sure that what I have matches this. If it does not, then I need to go back to my put statement and make corrections accordingly, right? So here it is. Now what I want to do is, let me copy the next command. Uh, here, I'm gonna, I can look at the second row. Now look, notice that uh, there is a first row. I wanted to see the, the difference in the output. I'm taking a different row, but I'm also looking at the same family. Okay, now here, I get breakfast and I get type. There, I got only breakfast. And it's because I never specified the type. I'm not going to get something like type and no, right? No, nope, there is no such a thing as no. Now, what I could do is this. I can specify, I can select two families, right? And to do that, you can leave them in uh, brackets, right? So here it is. I put column, and then in the brackets, I put the common delimited list of the, the families that I want to look at. And it's going to give me whatever I have for these two families in the specified row, right? Uh, similarly, I can pull only a single, uh, like see this, oops, single, prop, oops, single, like see here, I want to check, I'm not interested what amenities they may have, I only want to check, oops, if I, if I have, if I have a gym, right, oops, it's because I did not copy, so take a look at this, what I have to do is, I have to, I have to go back here, oops, and I can copy this command, and, okay, just to make sure, uh, I'm, okay, this is a scan command, I have, I still have to be running the get command, okay, here it is, now, so get command, we're only getting a single row, All right, so here's the problem with the get command, uh, I only can get one row, right, so if I wanted to see it, the value of the, uh, here of the room type for all hotels where I have room type available, I cannot use get command because I would have to run a separate get command for, for as many times as the number of rows that I inserted, right? So I would have to do a count and then keep on going, which is inconvenient, right? Uh, I have, we have a different solution to do that. We could do the scan command. So, just the scan command by itself is going to return everything. Oops. Okay, so I did not put it in a buffer. So, control C. And now I have to do the paste. There we go. Jesus. But I'm not interested in this. I want to see only a certain, certain uh, families, right? So this is a similar syntax, similar to the get command, but the only, the big difference is that you're picking up uh, the, you're picking up the specified row range. Right now it did not specify the row range, okay? And I realize it's past nine, but I promise you I'm going to show you something that's not in the walkthrough, but only if you stay through the end, okay? So now, here, I basically specified which columns I want to see, and for each column, I want to specify the specific property, okay? 
like for example over here I want to see for the for the accommodation I want to see if it has a breakfast and for my amenity I want to see if I have a spa something like that so this one is right now it's running against all rows but why I don't have a third row and the reason is because the third row does not have anything populated in a breakfast and in a spa look here if you look here there's nothing for the breakfast here and there is nothing for the spa so that's the reason my third row did not get returned right uh, you might find it a little bit helpful when you do when you create this conceptual view it, you might find it helpful as you're working on your uh, homework and now here I can specify I can specify more right here I'm just basically telling you that I can pick one uh, attribute from each from each family right I'm just showing you that I have this flexibility here okay now what I'm gonna do and uh, so here in the same thing but it's just gonna give me what it's gonna give me where what all rows that have see this either spa I'm gonna find out which hotels have a uh, spa and which hotels have gym right so this is this that's the way to say it list me the hotels where I know if they have whether they have the gym or a spa right uh, sometimes we don't know, but I want to see what wherever I know, right? I want to see wherever the spa and gym are specified, okay? That's what I did here. Now what I'm going to do is, let's see if I can select the, what can I do to specify the rows? Uh, here, I can say that I want my start row to be greater or equal to nine. So what it's going to do is I expect this to return my the row starting from the row nine. Okay. So let's see what it does. Well, it returns the row nine. Okay. And the reason is because well, if you take a look at how the sorting was, remember uh, when it sorted by the row key, it put uh, the ten ahead of the ahead of the two right so it's thinking that not that uh, nine is greater than ten right do you remember that so if I do this do you remember it it it, it does this here see this it does the ten here so basically that's the reason I did not see the row ten I expected to get it but I did not and if I did not I need to take a look at what's going on right now here I can specify where where to stop and I want to and, and and I want to stop at the row two right here I'm saying that I want to stop when the row is two so you want to think for yourself okay aha uh -huh. I expected to get row number one why why did I get one and ten well that's because ten is, is uh, uh, below two right here I can specify both start and stop right here we go now I can combine my filter I can specify which uh, columns I want to see and I can specify this the rows at the same time right so basically what I did was I just combined this see this here I do columns and then I do comma and I put start row and I put stop row let's let's step back and think about what do I want to see I want to see uh, the data any data that I have for the accommodation family and amenity family and I want to start from row 2 and I want to add a row 5 right let's see okay 2 3 5 but it excluded 5 uh, because the stop row is a uh, See this stop row is greater or equal than five. Right? So stop stop row five means that we don't show five. We stop, right? That's what it is, I guess. Yes. So start row is the row where we start displaying. 
stop row is a row where there is stop, so we don't show the stop row. This, there's a little trick here. If you ever see the multiple choice question like this, sometimes they can trick you, right? So stop row does not get displayed, does not get returned. Uh, here, I can just, if I wanted to, I can specify, right? Because I don't want to see the whole family. I want to see a single piece, right? There we go. So here, this, that was just the... Uh, here, basically, I'm not filtering by value. I'm filtering only by uh, start row, stop row, and which columns I want to see, right? Uh, here, here, I'm just saying that I can uh, do both. I can take more than one. Uh, I can take, I, I can specify the columns that I want to see in more than one family, right? I'm just showing you different things that can be done. Ah, I got nothing returned. So, why do you think is that? Well, uh, because I'm supposed to get, what, what do I expect to get? I expect to get row number 8, and I'm supposed to get uh, amenity gym and amenity spa. So, let's go here and let's look at row 8. There is nothing specified, right? So, my code returned no data, but it's expected result, right? So I got the expected result, right? So I wanted to show an example when nothing was returned. Well, on the other hand, this oops, here I have I have the same criteria. See this? The only difference that I did was I changed the start row, and now I'm going to get something returned. Uh, I'm going to get something returned now because rows four and five have the values, right? Okay, now, oops, let's go back here. This, this is the fun part. Now, a column prefix spa. What, what am I supposed to get right now? Well, think about it. What is column prefix? Just think about it. Is it something like a column name? Am I supposed to get all data where the column starts with the word spa then you think it is well that's what i got i got a many to spa then what did i get row one four nine let's go back to my data yep see this i have one column spa and i get one four nine so people pay attention this is not in a in a word document right so here it is now i filtered uh, I want to see uh, any any values with the field uh, that that starts. And the name of the field starts far. See, so this is because we don't re we might not know uh, how many fields we have, right? Well, actually, you can run the describe command to see. You can run the describe command to see the the field that you have in a table. Well, however, this is just one way to do it, because somebody could misspell, right? Like, for instance, uh, there could be something like a complex uh, room type, perhaps. Somebody could spell it as room underscore type, or somebody can spell it as a single word. And I might not know exact spelling, but uh, two spelling could essentially be the same meaning. So then I could say uh, where the the Attribute name starts with the, with the prefix room, right? So that's when it's useful. So that was the prefix filter. And I put a little summary here. I can let you have this file. But uh, see, here it is. Now, oh, it's, it's a column prefix filter, column prefix filter. Now I'm going to show you the prefix filter. Prefix filter is going to work on a, on a key. Is this supposed to give me all rows with the keys that start with one, right? So I'm supposed to get everything in row one and everything in row ten. This is what I'm supposed to get, and this is what I got, right? This is also not in a in a in a walkthrough document. I do it intentionally. I like to show what's not in the walkthrough. Okay, now column. Count cell filter. <laughs> this is a little funny. So I'm going to run it and you try to guess what it does. <laughs> Take a look at this. 
I'm looking at the row number one, and it gave me what breakfast. It's looking at the it looking at the accommodation, breakfast. Then it's looking at the room type, and then it's looking at the gym, right? And it stops at the three. Is it? It picked three properties, right? And in this case, it's going to accommodation, breakfast, room type, and gym. Then it's looking at other rows, and it's checking if any of the remaining rows has this populated breakfast, room type, and gym. So it's sticking with the first three, right? Somehow it picked the first three, and then it's going to check if other rows have values in this first three which is uh, accommodation breakfast, accommodation room type, accommodation gym. It just pick the four three. Okay. Now what we can do, uh, this is going to be the first key only. This one takes no input parameter, but it's going to pick up the first, it's going to pick up the first populated field, the first populated property in each row. Right? So let's see what it does. Okay, see this? Uh, for some reason, it put, well, it, it put accommodation uh, before general information, which makes sense, right? So accommodation is going to be first. And then in the first row, see this? If you look at it, accommodation is stored before amenity, right? So it's accommodation, amenity, and then general information. So, then the first populated field in the first row is presidential suit room type. The first populated row in the, in the second, the first populated field in the second row is going to be this breakfast, right? For the third row, it's going to be pool. For the fourth row, it's going to be breakfast, right? Here, it's going to be gym. Let's go back and let's check if we got what we expected to get. Looks like we did, right? So here it's all it's returning the only the first one. Here is the first three. But what are the first three? The first three is room time, breakfast, gym. Okay? It's not gonna start from general information because accommodation goes before general information. It has to do with the storage, right? Okay, now let's go ahead and do more. Uh this is a little bit complex. So here, I need your undivided attention. What we're going to do right now is we're going to run the value filter. And the way it works is that I'm going to look at the columns uh, and I'm going to say, well, I want to pick the accommodation breakfast and I want to pick the, the rows where accommodation is known. So this is just the syntax. Binary prefix none. This is how you do it. Well, it's a little bit complex, but the bottom line here is that I want to see where I have, where for sure as there is no breakfast. Like, for example, suppose that I don't want to stop in a hotel if it does not provide uh, a breakfast, right? So, let's see what's going to happen. Uh, what I have to do, I just paste that. Okay, now, what it did was it returned the uh, row number one and row number eight. See this? Row number one and row number eight. I have breakfast equals none. Let's go ahead and check a look, take a look at this. See this? None, none. And similar, I can do the included. This is just single value. If you wanted to uh, do the multi value, this is excellent homework. I'll leave it as a homework. It's, I'll leave it as an optional homework. If you want to read the documentation and explore it, right? Okay. But I'm showing you the starter. So now you know that you can do the value filter, right? That, that, that's what I did here, right? I picked uh, just one field, right? Only one. And then here I'm filtering by this. I'm filtering by value and I said it known. Now what I can do is I can add versions. So right now if you look at the table structure I'm storing only 
only one version, right? If you go to the, the thing and do the describe. Oh, that's not what I want. I want to do the describe hotel, right? Oops. Okay. And, and I want to do the describe, right? And you can see this. So, what version is that when I overwrite something, it's gonna go forever, right? Like if I'm going to update something, uh, the value, the, the, the values that I had before, it's gonna be gone. That's it, right? There is no way to restore it. Uh, on the other hand, if I have a version, it will stay there. I'm creating a new version. Currently, I cannot do that because my, my property is a number of versions everywhere is set to one. Uh, in order to allow me to have to store multiple versions, I need to run the alter command. Alter command is a data a definition command, and what it does, it changes the property. So here, I specify name amenity. Name is a family name, and here I'm going to change the attribute uh, called version. So basically, after I run this command and after I run the describe again, I expect this number here to change to 2. This is what I expect. When I run this command, right, that I just showed you, and when I run the describe command again, see this, this is amenity, I expect this to be 2. Let's see if I'm going to get what I expect to get. Uh, I'm going to do this right now. And this is only going to change the number of versions for amenity. It's not going to change the number of versions for accommodation. So now I did that. And notice I was able to do that without disabling the table. Okay, now let's do that. I'm going to use the up error key to get this describe command. Let's see if I got what I expected. Yes, I got it what I expected to get, right? So now I have two versions. Okay, now let's do this. Let's run the put command. And when you run a put command, if the value already exists, you will, uh, when you when you put command in general, it attempts to add value. If the value already exists, it will either overwrite the current value or it will add a new version, right? Or if, if there is already the new, if there is already an older version, it's going to check if you exceeding the limit. If you are exceeding the limit, it will remove, I believe it removes the oldest older version. But for right now, I can go ahead and run another put command. And I'm going to add the pool. Right? I'm going to update the amenity pool. And, and this is the third row, right? So I'm going to run an update. And I'm going to get update the third row. Pool, no. Right? So now what's going to happen? Uh, to get to, to see this effect, I have to run this, the scan command, right? So let's, 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 let's do this. Let's just run, let's just run the scan command for right now. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to do this. Instead of put, I'm going to type scan, right? And I'm going to run this. Let let me show you something. Let's take a look at this. Uh, okay, so that was row three, right? Take take a look at the row uh, three, right here, and you should see two values for the. There should be two values for the pool, right? And it's because, oh, okay. So basically, when I update it, right, I should see two. Let me see, pool. Right, and this is pool no, but hold on, did it have a value before? So if I had a value, right, I should I should be able to see the I should be able to see two values. And uh okay, so let me let's go ahead and let's do let's do something else in here. Well it's it's really hard to see because right now I'm looking at uh multiple rows here, right? I'm looking at multiple rows. So in order for you to easier to to see it easily, you can just go ahead and filter it. Oh, but uh, take a look at it. The problem is that I didn't have. If I look at it here, 
I did not have, oh, I did have, I had ears, right? Yeah. So basically, what, what happened right now is that I put, uh, I put no here, right? So now it's no, but secretly somewhere behind the scene, I should still be able to retrieve the old value if I want to, because I said amenity versions too, right? So it, sh it should keep my uh, two versions now, uh, because I just did the outer table, right? So let's go ahead, let's get back here, and I can do it again, I can do again, but now I can do this, instead of no, let's try this, let's here, let's, let's try something dummy, let's try Yelena, right, okay, so, oh, okay, now let's do this, let's try the, the scan command, hotel, and if you go back, you're gonna see it. Oops! You're gonna see it that it's gonna it's gonna show me now that full <laughs> value equals Elena and Jesus. Somehow it just showed me the it just showed me the latest version right now, right? It showed me the latest version in the scan command. But you can specify the version you want to see, right? <laughs> there is a lot you can do, but right now, Jesus, uh, I can alter it even more. Oops, here it is. There we go. I can now do this. See this? I can I can alter I can I can I can add another version, see this? And then I can delete, right? I can delete uh this, I can delete the whole family, right? Okay. Or what I could also do is I can change the number of versions again, right? But what delete will do is Delete is supposed to delete uh, all versions. If I don't specify the version number when I run the delete command, it's going to delete all versions. Right? So when I do delete, I have an option. I can I can uh, delete only one, right? I can, when I delete, I can delete only one version. I can I can specify the version. Or if I don't do this, then I'm going to delete everything, which I did in this case. And now, if you do the, if 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 you do the the describe command, where is it describe? You will see that I deleted the whole family, right? I deleted the whole family. So uh, here, basically, I can delete, right? And I can alter. I can do this, but. I cannot do, drop. I cannot drop my table uh, uh, if the table is enabled. Right? If the table is enabled, I cannot uh, delete the table. Now let's see what happens here. Let's see what happens here. <laughs> Am I able to add the, the family back like this? I think so. Jesus, I was able to add it back, but I'm not going to have anything in there, right? And the reason is, I did not add any properties, right? I did not add anything. Let's take a look if I do this. Okay, see this? This is what I can do. It's gonna be, it's gonna be much easier if I do this here. I just copy paste, but instead I'm gonna, I'm gonna delete the, look, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to delete the, accommodation and I'm just gonna keep a menu here right there we go so now I'm going to do this I got one row right but there isn't there's really okay here it is I got one row oh how did I get one row oh did I run oh because I ran the, the statement right I ran see this I just get one row in here right it's because just the pool, right? Isn't it because I just, I, I ran a command to put one row, right? Yes, that's what I did. I ran a command to put one row. Now, let, let's do that. Let's run again. Let's do that again. Uh, and I'm going to do this here. Put hotel. Okay, this one. Yelena. And then I'm going to do again the scan. Okay. See this? It's it showing me, by default, it's just showing me the last one, right? By default, it's showing me the la last one. And, uh, okay, so now what I could also do is, uh, ultimately, I could run uh, get command, right? 
So if I know which row, this is a row three, right? So I have to put the the, the table table name and then the, the <laughs> I have to put the column name. So that's three. Oops, I forget the comma. Remember that you can, you, you need the comma. Scissors, okay. Scissors. It also show me here. It's also showing me this. So now now it's a value Helena, but it's actually you can specify the wor the version, and I believe it's just a version parameter. Yeah, it just just it's just a version. Let okay. Yeah, it, it's not in here, but I believe you just specify uh, the version. It's in a in a in a filter, in a filter you can specify the version and uh, say the version numbers that you want to see. Okay. But any questions about what I just showed? And this one, uh, that one is in uh, in here. See, so you want to, there is such a thing as a code reuse. You want to reuse a code, but the work that you actually uh, turn in should be your original, right? The project should not be copied from anywhere else. It should be your original project, okay? So basically, what, oh, here it is. See, this, this is an example. Version 2. Oh, this is alter. And then somewhere in that example, I think I'm selecting, I'm, I'm, somewhere in this example, I'm selecting only the specific version. Yeah, see this? Scan, and here I'm specifying that I want to see the second version. There we go. That's what we have to do. We have to specify versions. So now let's go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, but I have to use the scan command, right? So this is a scan command, and then here I'm just going to copy and paste this piece here, and instead of two, I want to see my uh, first version, right? So this, and I'm going to put one. There we go. So this, <laughs> this is supposed to give me this as a first version, right? Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Aha! Yes! It's not a version number, it's number of versions that I want to see. Aha! <laughs> uh -huh. Take a look at this. You put one, and you expect to get the first version. So now you remember that Yelena made this mistake, right? It's supposed to show, it, it's actually supposed to show the number of version and the timestamp, right? So now, if I want to do this, let's see the, 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 the put command, <laughs> and I'm going to put something like, let's put something like xxx, Right, and then I'm going to rerun this command. Let's see what I'm going to get. See this? I'm getting now XXX. It's because I want to see two versions, right? And ultimately I can do three. I think because I allow three, right? So this is my three version. But then when I delete, I can specify the versions that I want to delete, right? I don't have to delete uh, all three, right? I can delete the specific version. Like, for example, I made a change XXX. If I don't like it, I can just delete this version and I can back up to whatever I was before. Right? So, that, does anybody have questions? Is everyone still awake? Guess what happens when nobody has questions? Elena starts asking questions, right? So. Do you remember the differences between get command and scan command? When would you use each? Anybody? Suppose that I want to return 10 rows. Will get command work? Well, I can run it 10 times, but... Nope. So, so you want to run the scan command, right? Well... Right, so you want to make sure that you understand the different types of commands, right? <laughs> the data manipulation and the data definition, and some general shell commands to check the environment, right? Oh, and in your homework assignment, make sure that you prefix the table name with your initials, and also do not, do not open any tickets. If you're running into trouble, your first line of contact is your TA. Posting a discussion will depend on what an issue is. 
but do not open any tickets. We have to resolve the issue internally first, okay? Because sometimes it's just uh, the user error, right? So just just remember, contact me first before because I the TAs have to be the first line of the contact, okay? Elena, yes. uh, just let me know that they are only three students. I I'm assume interested. they haven't worked it. That's why they are not questioned. So I don't know how you supposed to. Yeah. Continue and, the and, thing. Yeah. And nobody caught me when I did that version thing. <laughs> I did it intentionally. Anyways. <laughs> okay. So I guess we call it a night, right? Elena, do we call it a night? Well, if they are not questioned, yes. Let's see if they have questions. Just give them two minutes. I think they well, look at that chat. Work it I, I don't see anything in the chat. Nothing. I don't see any question anywhere. Yeah. Yes. Mike? What? Oh yes, yes. Mikey said that you're sure that you have questions. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but the question and answer session does not end right now. If you have questions, you pose them. Yeah. Sure. And the discussions. Go ahead and uh, post questions about um, you know all three topics. I would say HDFS, MapReduce, and HBase. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I think we are. It's been a very uh, intense two weeks, three major topics in two weeks, so we give them some time. Mm -hmm. yeah. These are actually very intense two weeks. That's why we put the assignment optional, but that doesn't mean you don't do the assignment. I think if you don't put this mandatory, <laughs> they don't do it. And this was just without stress to learn as much as possible. That was the decision pedagogically. Since it's too much, we are not putting this a lot of weight in the grade, but in the knowledge, yes. Yeah, so. yeah. That's right. And, uh, you know, discussions are a good place for you to ask questions, your doubts, and uh, get a better understanding. <clears throat> 